Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it is my privilege as president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics to welcome you back to the C. Fred Bergston Conference Center in the Peter G. Peterson Building for this year's Stavros Niarchos Lecture. Why am I making such a big deal about the names? Because these are all people or people coming from those people who helped build this institution into what it is today. And we're very privileged as a reflection of our role in the world to have a true world leader, the Secha Kiganyago or Kanyago, again, please Al, forgive me for my terrible pronunciation, um, to be this year's Stavros Niarchos lecturer. Uh, Secha is of course governor of the South Amer African Reserve Bank and chair of the IMFC. We'll talk more about him most of the evening in a moment. Um, but first, I just wanted to say a couple words that this lecture series is now in its 19th year. This is the signature event of our calendar. It's the biggest honor the Peterson Institute can convey. I see a few uh, recent previous honorees, including our friend David Lipton sitting right here. Uh, our own Larry Summers and Fred Bergston, um, and many others of note. Um, the Niarchos Foundation, the Savros Niarchos Foundation, I tell the story every year the last few years, but it bears repeating, had the vision to build and give graciously and build in a constructive way in Athens in the midst of the worst economic crisis Athens and Greece have suffered. They not only provided human needs, they, for human needs, they provided a memory and a future of Greeks' incalculable cultural contribution to the world, to democracy, to liberal freedom, as embodied in the Stavros Niarchos Cultural Center in Athens. Um, and their leader, our friend um, Andreas Yerkopoulos, cannot be with us tonight. I'm very pleased to welcome another true friend of mine and of the Institute, Vasily Samis, the Chief Administrative Officer. Again, we will give him a chance to speak as well. Um, I mentioned the far-sighted investment in the past and future of Greece because, as many of you know, we live in an era where the macroeconomic challenges are getting in some ways more challenging. We do not have the overt crisis that we had a decade ago, thanks in part to the actions of some central bankers and economic leaders. But we do have the challenge of massively slowing growth and slowing productivity trend and anemic inflation in the rich world the lack of room or possibly even effectiveness for central banks to counter that. This was, of course, in part the topic of our vice chair of the board, Larry Summers, speech here this morning. Um, and we live in a world in which expertise, including this building, but including in other important institutions, public institutions around the world, is being challenged. And so this is a time when I think it is all the more important to recognize the room for learning that the rich countries of the so-called West have from those who have been trying to do the right thing in economic policy in other democracies and other places that have faced persistent economic challenges such as South Africa. And I am delighted to thank the Niarchos Foundation, Stavros Niarchos Foundation for their ongoing support of the Institute in this lecture series. I am delighted to thank Governor Kiganyago for being willing to accept our invitation after an arduous weekend chairing the IMFC. And I'm grateful to all of you for coming out tonight for this important event. But finally, I want to welcome for the second time on this particular podium, the chair of our board, Michael A. Peterson. Last year, we completed an important governance transition, and Michael Peterson took over as chair of the board of directors of this institute, named for his father, the co-founder with Fred Bergston and Tony Solomon of this place. We also named Steve Friedheim our vice chair, excuse me, Steve Friedheim our chair of the executive committee, and Lawrence Summers the vice chair of the board. <clears throat> 
And with those people and several others in this room, we have continued to strengthen the Institute's future while maintaining our core values, I believe. And the fact that so many great board members have joined us tonight, I view as a confirmation of their faith in both our values and our fulfillment of them. Um, and so this is my night to be particularly grateful and humble um, and just appreciate the fact that even in today's world, people of good spirit, good intellect, and good intent can come together and try to make the world a better place. Being a talking shop, going back to the Agora and the Acropolis, is not something to be dismissed. Sometimes it's the talking shops that make the most difference. So on that note, let me call on our chair of the board, Michael Peterson, to speak. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Um, since becoming chair last year, I've been really trying hard to get Adam to focus on maintaining the relevance of PIE. And we must remain relevant and continue to weigh in on the most timely issues of the day. And our research and events in particular must be on timely topics. So when I heard about this evening's uh, subject, I told Adam he was making a big mistake. I couldn't imagine any scenario where a bedrock principle like the independence of the Federal Reserve would ever become a prominent topic of conversation. Yeah. So I don't know what Adam was thinking, but here, here we are. Um, in all seriousness, we're very delighted and pleased to have you, Governor Hiranyango. Uh, we need you now more than ever, and we're very excited that you're here and will help us lead through these issues. Uh, mostly I'm here to thank once again the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. This is the 19th annual lecture in this series. It's an incredible record of consistency and support. Uh, and our dear friend Andreas Dukopoulos, former board member, I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight, but on, on his behalf we have Vasily Samus. He's been with them eight years, I believe, or since 2008, excuse me, 10 years now, 10, 11 years. And before the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, he held senior positions with Citigroup both in the US and Switzerland, and now he's doing great work for the foundation around the world. So we're really grateful for your continued record of support, and now welcome uh, Vasily Samus. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, again. Thank you, Adam, before. Thank you all, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is a true pleasure to be with here tonight. Andreas Drakopoulos, our foundation president and director since inception and former member of the board of Peterson Institute, as you heard from Adam, unfortunately could not make it. He sends you all his warmest personal regards. Ordinarily, nothing good comes out of panics, but a panic of 1907 may be the exception that proportions were unlimited, ultimately leading to the Congressional Act of 1913 to write the Federal Reserve Act and arguably with the six ensuing years between 1907 and 1913 were enough to cool off a highly emotional era and produce the, rise, the right outcome. Through this act, Congress directed the Federal Reserve to take care of the economy. They use a Greek word, economy. Ikos, the house, and nomos, order. Simply put, put your house in order. In more refined terms, the Fed was instructed to conduct monetary policy in support of a strong US economy setting three very specific goals. Maximum sustainable employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Since then, the Fed is called on each and every day to calculate based of, on incomplete information the probability of various outcomes. This is the definition of poker. As you all know, poker combines gambling, strategy, and skill in an emotional neutral way. All poker variants involve betting as an intrinsic part of a play and determine the winner of each hand according to the combination of player's cards, at least some of which are hidden until the very end of the hand. Now imagine an outsider with different agenda and objectives in a capricious and arbitrary way, randomly interfering in this already complex, devilishly confusing and curiously convoluted game. This evening, we'll hear 
Governor Gonyago argument for the importance of central bank independence, the expectation, or perhaps his wish, of not having outsiders interfere in this poker game. The history of this question in the United States provides its own argument for the importance of events like this one here tonight. In 1951, the Treasury Fed Accord notionally established the independence of the United States Federal Reserve. But the accord was essentially a handshake agreement, and it was inevitable that it would be eventually be challenged. A major challenge did come along in 1965, when President Lyndon Johnson asked the Fed Chair William Martin to avoid raising interest rates. Martin, once described by journalists as the happy Puritan, and was credited with quipping that the Fed's role is to take away the punch ball just as the party gets going, he demurred. As the story goes, Johnson, outraged, shoved Martin up against the wall. Several other similar instances are reported throughout history. White House Chief of Staff James Baker in the presence of Ronald Reagan as the same from Chair Chairman Volcker. And as uh, he wrote in his uh, newly released book, and while our current president asks his chairman this very same thing almost daily in arguably less private ways. The point of the Johnson story here is not to express a hope that tonight's discussion of central bank independence becomes so impassioned that it results in a physical altercation. <laughs> it is rather that regardless of the scope of the systems and institutions at play, personal interactions, face-to-face -face discussions, and individual perspectives will always have an important role to play. Events like this one here tonight create an open forum for experts like Governor Gonyago to offer individual insights and personal expertise. And for us, including those joining online, to engage in this discussion. We at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation will leave specific discussions on yield curve inversion, trade war impact, and the Consumer Confidence Index to you, the economists. But on the topic of discussion itself, we do have something to say. Since our establishment 23 years ago, the foundation grant making was support some 4,400 good causes around 124 countries around the world in the area of arts and culture, education, social welfare, health, medicine, and sports. An increasing focus in the grant making has been sustaining spaces where open discussion, civil discourse, and civil engagement can take place, and on supporting institutions that produce and disseminate rigorous expert analysis. This includes support for the creation of vibrant public spaces like the reimagined Mid Manhattan branch in the New York Public Library, set to reopen later on this year, and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center in Athens that Adam made reference before, a world-class state-of-the-art cultural, educational, and recreation public forum, an urban complex that includes the new facilities of the National Library of Greece and the Greek National Opera. Our grant making also includes support for enhancing and extending the work of think tanks like the Chatham House in London and the CSIS here in Washington. It includes our own monthly dialogue series and our annual summer philanthropic and cultural conferences, both of which open conversations with the public, which is the opening of the dialogues of, with the public at large of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. And this includes transformative grants for new programs focusing on fostering civic engagement and civil discourse at leading in universities, notably the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University in the nearby Baltimore, and the SNF Pedia program at Penn. So we are glad to have this opportunity to be here with you tonight, and we are sure there will be fascinating and wonderful presentation that we're expecting to hear. I would also take, I'd like to take a moment to note that is not here, uh, who's not here with us tonight, which is Pete Peterson, whose smile we had the pleasure of sharing, whose wisdom we benefited from, whose leadership we followed for many years. SNF is thankful for the opportunity to honor Pete's legacy by continuing to support this lecture series as we have done for the last 19 years, as Adam said. We have no plans to take away the punch ball anytime soon. Yes. <laughs> Thanks again to the Peterson Institute and of course for Governor Ganyago, who we're here very much looking forward to hearing from. <laughs>
Thank you all very much. I, I'm afraid before you hear Governor Cagnago, there is one more step, and it is a step that I think we will all benefit from and enjoy. We have, for the last six or seven years of this fabulous series, had introductions of our honored speaker, the annual lecturer, by people who know them and know their field well. And tonight, we have prevailed upon our executive committee of our board members, the Honorable Stanley Fisher, to give the introduction. Uh, Stan is many things to many people, all of them good. Um, Stan was the unique leader as first deputy managing director of the IMF. He was a professor and a scholar of the utmost skill and generosity as well as brilliance. He led some of the first work on central bank independence with his then co-author, now deputy governor, of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Guy DeBell, some 26 years ago. And of course, he served notably as governor of the Bank of Israel and vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board, a one-two punch that I think literally no other human being can claim. Um, I have said often, and I will say it again, Stan is to me the platonic ideal of the central banker. Um, and we're honored and pleased to have him with us tonight and have his service as a member of the executive committee of our board. Stan. Uh, thanks very much, Adam, and uh, thanks particularly uh, to the speaker who complained this evening that I'd never pronounced his name correctly, so uh, I will start with that. Uh, his name is Lesetia Chanyago. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Chanyago. Uh, you have to clap. Okay, so that's who we're talking about, and we're going to have the pleasure of listening to his Niakos lecture, which is entitled Principled Agents, Reflection on Central Bank Independence. I don't know when you chose this title, but you couldn't have chosen a better day to deliver it, uh, given what's going on right now uh, in Washington. Lesetia has been uh, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank since 2014, having served as deputy governor from May 2011 until he was appointed governor. Before that, he worked from 2004 in the South African National Treasure, Treasury as Director General, which means that he came to the Reserve Bank with a thorough understanding of the Treasury and the budget, which is something that would serve any governor well. I first met Lesetia in the 1990s as the Mandela government took control over South Africa. The government turned to be sure, extremely carefully to the IMF. It was a pleasure to work with that team and to see how competent the senior treasury personnel were. With Trevor Manuel as finance minister and Maria Ramos as director general. Lesetia was clearly a rising star of the ministry. At that stage, I didn't know that uh, Lesetia and I had grown up close to each other geographically he near the northern border of South Africa, I near the southern border of what is now Zimbabwe and had earlier been southern Rhodesia. But there is a serious distance between the dates at which this young man and I uh, grew up and there's also a serious difference in the worlds in which we lived when we were growing up. It is clear to anyone who gets to know Lesetia even somewhat that he is an impressive person. But I had not worked with him sufficiently to really know him. So I asked someone who has worked extensively with him to describe Lesetia, the human being, in words that I could quote. And with Maria Ramos's permission, I will quote some of what she wrote back to me. It was a seven-point letter. I have uh, contracted it a bit.
one. He is one of the most courageous people I know. As governor, he has had to take on an extraordinary defense of the constitutional independence of the South African Reserve Bank, not only because it's the appropriate thing to do for the bank, but importantly because it's in the interests of sound and sustainable growth. Two, he has a deep understanding about the things that matter for South Africa and for developing countries in general. He's an accomplished macro and monetary economist who is also passionate about the issues that matter for development, which is to say that he understands how the policy choices we make impact people. Points three to six in Maria's letter describe different aspects of his personality and his character. He's an extraordinary and pa passionate communicator. He's a health fanatic. He's at the gym several times a week. He's a mean walker. I take it that means he walks faster than Maria. Uh, and he likes climbing. He and the family try to do the Drakensberg uh, once a year. The Dr Drakensberg uh, mount mountain uh, range on the uh, eastern side of uh, South Africa and the famous 100-mile uh, ma uh, marathon, a double marathon, is run up and down, up its hill, hills, and then down uh, its hills. He's an incredibly proud family man. His wife is an accomplished executive in the property and hospitality sectors who serves as a non-executive director on a number of boards. And they are the proud parents of two sons and a daughter who mean the world to their parents. And number seven, if a poll was taken in South Africa asking who are the most trusted and respected people in the country, he would be in the top three. And this is from somebody who knows what she's talking about. Well, I could stop here, but I would like to add, uh, for the economists present, that Lissetia has been a rising star in the world of governors. For those of you who don't know them, the governors are a small, frequently considerably independent, reputedly extremely powerful group of people who make monetary policy and also, in many countries, supervise the financial system. At the beginning of 2018, Lissetia was appointed to be chairman of the International Monetary and Financial Committee, the IMFC. The acronym IMFC was probably chosen before the four words in it that form it, for it is close, the closest thing the IMF has to the council, it's a political council, referred to in Schedule D of the Articles of Agreement. Article D and the Council were very close to the heart of Managing Director Michel Kandesu, who worked very hard during his 14-year leadership of the fund to establish a council along the lines of Schedule D of the Articles of Agreement. Uh, the Council was est established to be, would be established to be the supreme body of the IMF. Um, in fact, the fund doesn't have that council. The body that Lissetia chairs, the IMF committee, comprises finance ministers and central bank governors who meet twice a year. Uh, if you go into that splendid room and see the IMFC in session, you could believe that it is the world's governing body for monetary and financial matters. But that is not strictly the case for the IMFC and here I quote using Lissetia's words, quotation starts here, the, I, the I, IMFC is the primary advisory body of the IMF Board of Governors and deliberates on the practical policy issues facing the IMF, which is to say that it's not the uh, people, the governors and the uh, finance ministers sitting around the table uh, who make the decisions, they are an advisory body. But you could sometimes believe that they are the people who make the decisions. It is true 
that the choice of Lesetia to be chair of the IMFC reflects the confidence the members of the board of governors have in him. And beyond that, he has been prominent in the governance of the Bank for International Settlements, the governance of the World Bank, and the operations of the Financial Stability Board. Lesetia, let me uh, say a few words to you, just a few. You have honored us by accepting this invitation to deliver the 19th Niarchos Lecture, and we look forward to listening to your address on the importance of maintaining central bank independence, a topic that is gathering immense amounts of attention at present and is likely to continue becoming more widely and intensively discussed in the months and perhaps even years to come. The outcome of that debate will have an important effect on the importance, on the, on the performance of the world economy and we had better get it right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Esten. With uh, those uh, uh, kind words, um, uh, I guess uh, I should not disappoint with what I'm going to say. Uh, I must also say that I'm uh, honored to be to be here, uh, but I'm not sure if I should say I am happy. The Stavros uh, Niachos lecture tackles ma major world problems. In 2016, David Lipton discussed the backlash against globalization. In 2017, Mervyn King explored global macroeconomic imbalances. Last year, uh, Thaman Sham, uh, Shan Mugaratham looked at wage stagnation and the decline of social mobility. This year, I have been invited to discuss central bank independence. There is a pattern here. Central banks must be in trouble. <laughs> Looking around the world, there are signs of this trouble in many places, including advanced economies, where institutional stability can no longer be taken for granted. You will all be able to think of examples. The Bank of England has been criticized for warning about the costs of Brexit, which just shows that giving good advice in a polarized political environment is no way to make friends. As for the United States, everyone likes telling the Fed what to do, and as we have seen, this edge is not confined to those without authority. Elsewhere, conflict over central banks' reserves has led to governors resigning. And of course, in South Africa, the independence of the Reserve Bank has also come under threat in recent years, which must be why you think I am the person to discuss the subject. Tonight, I will briefly review the textbook case for central bank independence, which centers on the well-known time inconsistency problem. It is an elegant analysis, but it only covers a narrow part of central banking. In particular, it does not apply very well to financial sector mandates, such as financial stability or bank, banking regulation which are core duties for many central banks. I want to argue, however, that the case for central bank independence goes further. The issue is actually another classic economic concept, the principal agent problem. How can societies get their leaders to look after the public interest instead of their own short-term political interests? This is one of the fundamental difficulties of government. In my experience, it has also been the main reason the South African Reserve Bank has needed its independence. Independence allowed us to deliver on our mandate, as set down in the Constitution. Independence ensured that the tremendous powers of a central bank, such as printing money, or licensing and supervising banks 
couldn't be taken over by politically connected individuals bent on looting the state instead of saving the citizens. I am not sure exactly how this should be modeled, how we could prove the point in a large empirical study and get a peer-reviewed article out of it, but it has been my lived experience for some years now. There is a saying, there are no atheists in, a fox hole, in foxholes. We have been on the front lines lately. The place where good and bad governance meet, and I promise you, in that situation, you really learn to believe in central bank independence. Let's start with the textbook case. Kaitland and Prescott uh, showed that governments suffer from a time inconsistency problem. They'd like to promise low inflation in future, but when the future shows up, they discover it is easier to tolerate higher inflation instead. As a result, lenders, firms, and workers start to anticipate tight up, up inflation, and everyone ends up living in a world they would not choose, with a built-in bias towards higher inflation and higher interest rates. The solution to the problem is an independent central bank with a clear mandate to control inflation. With this mandate in place, governments do not have to pay higher inflation risk premium on their debt and society as a whole gets to enjoy lower levels of inflation. This is why central bank, central bank independence has been described as a free lunch. Is there such? But this time, in, time consistency argument does not cover the whole case for independence. In particular, it says nothing about financial stability mandate nor about narrower bank supervision duties which occupy a lot of central bank staff. One response to this is to concede that these things are not like price stability and do not require independence. By this logic, monetary policy should have its own safe space, but not other mandates. As Ben Bernanke has argued, for instance, and I quote, there should be no spillover from monetary policy independence to independence in other spheres of activity. In practice, the Federal Reserve engages cooperatively with other agencies of the US government on a wide range of financial and supervisory issues without compromising the independence of monetary policy, close quote. Unfortunately, it is not always and everywhere the case that the two can be combined so harmoniously. Serious threats to, cent threats to central bank independence are possible, even when the sanctity of monetary policy is intact. For a telling example of the problem, consider Cyprus. As a member of the euro area, Cyprus does not have an independent monetary policy. It has a large banking sector, however. And when this sector fell into crisis in 2013, that also generated a serious threat to the independence of the central bank. Cyprus's banking crisis was the result of falling asset prices, particularly for Greek government bonds. The banks bought this, bought this in 2009 and 2010 and incurred haircuts as part of the Greece as part of Greece's 2011 debt restructuring. The result was banks that were probably insolvent, but which were also simultaneously too big to fail and too big to bail. Tackling this problem required several desperate measures, including emergency liquidity assistance from the European Central Bank, strict capital controls, a two-week shutdown of the entire banking system, and even bail-ins for the bank bondholders and uninsured depositors. The politics of this were predictably toxic, especially 
in a small country where many people depended on the banks for their wealth and status. The central bank got the job of administering much of the crisis management and resolution process, not least because it had the trust of the international lenders. Perhaps, invariably, it then became a scapegoat with critics questioning its motives and patriotism. Although the independence of the central bank was secured by EU treaty and the position of the governor was protected, the bank's independence was compromised anyway. It achieved this by expanding the board of the central bank of Cyprus and giving it more power. The board then switched reporting lines away from the governor to its own members. So bank staff ended up answering to the board instead. The European Central Bank issued a legal opinion questioning these matters, but they were adopted anyway. And the European Commission did not take legal action in response. Sidelined and under constant personal attack, the governor resigned. I claim no expertise about Cyprus's economy. And there are probably people in the audience who know many interesting details of that country's crisis that I have overlooked. I drew this account from the memoirs of the former governor. The point I want to make is that the independence of a central bank can be greatly compromised without monetary policy coming into dispute. Indeed, even without the central bank issuing its own sovereign currency or having much control over monetary policy, which of course was being set in Frankfurt. One answer to uh, this problem is to say that independent agencies like central banks shouldn't be controlling bailouts and resolutions. The distributional consequences are too large. The preferences of society are not clear or stable, and the scope for accountability and transparency is too limited. The natural endpoint of this logic is that financial stability and bank supervision problems should stay in the political realm with the line ministries and the, their political heads instead of being delegated to independent agencies. In this way, central banks can focus narrowly on monetary policy and have independence for that without wading into the mire of finance and perhaps being dragged down. But there are two problems with this argument for narrow central banking. First, not many central banks do man narrow monetary policy. If the plan for safeguarding central bank independence is to hive off non-monetary mandates in other bodies, then we have lost our way. Most jurisdictions are adding new duties for central banks, not taking them away. This is related to the second problem. In a crisis, central banks find it hard to stay on the sidelines or escape blame. To borrow an anecdote, anecdote, recall that in the UK it was the Financial Services Authority and not the Bank of England which was the lead regulatory agency for the financial sector. But when Northern Rock failed in 2007, it was Mervyn King whose picture ended up in The Economist alongside the heading, the bank that failed. The FSA does not exist anymore and the Bank of England now has responsibility for financial stability. The lesson learned, one taken to heart in many places, was that central banks have unique powers as le the lenders of last resort. No one else can flood a banking system with liquidity like a central bank. As a result, a promise to stop a bank run or to do whatever it takes has unique power coming from a central bank. These institutions also lend to have the institutional cap uh, capital in the form of expertise, access to international networks, especially fellow central bankers, and reputations as responsible technocrats, which can be very helpful in coordinating responses amongst diverse stakeholders. For these reasons, a central bank sitting at zero lower bound during a financial crisis will struggle to stick to a narrow monetary mandate. And this is even before 
we reflect that financial crisis are also likely to prompt big misses of inflation targets as happened in many advanced economies after the global financial crisis. The implication is that financial stability is also very important for inflation targets. So, central bankers probably cannot steer clear of financial stability and bank regulation. Yet that conclusion doesn't make the space any safer for independent central banks. I can testify to this from my own experience in South Africa. We are all used to thinking about attacks on central banks as demands to cut rates for political reasons. But I have never got a call or any other communication from the union buildings, the seat of the executive uh, in South Africa, telling me what to do with monetary policy. Similarly, my toughest public engagement haven't been about interest rates. They have been about the financial system. Twice a year, we have monetary policy forums outside of the financial centers, but we barely talk about monetary policy. Instead, we get questions about two things. One is a sideshow issue, which is the fact that the Reserve Bank has uh, private shareholders. That these shareholders don't have any policy control. <coughs> Excuse me. They get tiny dividends about uh, $14,000 per year collectively. And the private ownership is in the basis of our independence. Still, it sounds strange that they are private shareholders and people have questions which we answer. The other thing we get asked about is the financial sector, especially issues around transformation, financial inclusion, and development. And the financial sector work is also where we have had the most difficult time politically. Let me just pause a moment to note that monetary policy has had its problems. The South African economy has experienced a prolonged slump with negative per capita GDP growth since 2013. At the same time, we have had inflation mostly at or above the top end of our target range. We have had to raise interest rates in the midst of a downturn to keep inflation expectations in check and stuff off worst scenarios like the crisis that hit Turkey and Argentina last year. We are now getting inflation where we want it, in the middle of our target range, which is a rate we intend to maintain. But that hasn't provoked more than the usual grumbling and op-eds. No major onslaughts. The attacks came from other, for other reasons. I will describe three big ones. The first involved banking services for politically connected people. As has now been widely reported, some very senior figures in the South African government developed warm relations with a family of businessmen. When it became clearer that a lot of that family's money wasn't clean, commercial banks became unwilling to handle their accounts for fear of violating laws against facilitating money laundering. This made it nearly impossible for the family to run its operations and sparked a political fight back. We started feeling pressure to force banks to service these accounts in violation of the law. In addition, we came under pressure to allow this family to obtain a banking license by buying a small bank. We even faced the threat of bank, bank licensing being taken away from the SAP altogether. We were using our independence to uphold the, a law against dirty money flows, and that made us enemies. The second problem was over a small mutual bank. This institution had spent most of its life quietly taking deposits from retail savers and extending mostly mortgage loans. 
Frankly, we didn't realize the full extent of what was going on until the very end. Starting in 2013, new management took over the bank and turned it into a crude Ponzi scheme. The um, innovation was bribing public officials to deposit municipal funds at the mutual bank in exchange for Christmas presents. They then simply spent these deposits on themselves, accumulating fancy cars and a helicopter or two along the way. When we noted the significant growth in the business, we started engaging the bank about converting to a commercial banking license. Ultimately, we realized something was wrong when they failed to make a routine payment through the national payment system. It turned out they had no money left, but they nearly got away with it for longer because they almost received a huge deposit from a public sector rail operator which would have kept the Ponzi scheme going. I should also note that one of the reasons we missed what was going on was that one of the people involved in the looting was a partner at a big four accounting firm who signed off the accounts. We accepted audited accounts as a true reflection of the business. When we put the mutual bank into curatorship, we came under attack from people who said we were targeting this business because it was a black owned bank. We were accused of undermining black excellence and protecting the interests of white capitalists. You know the saying that patriotism is the last refuge of scoundrels. Well, in South Africa, you really need, when you really need somewhere to hide, it is not in patriotism, but in race politics. And these guys really needed a place to hide. They just perpetuated a big bank robbery. Most troubling of all, they did it by stealing money sent by government for service delivery to some of South Africa's poorest people. And that municipal money was lost. This did not stop people saying we should save the bank because it served the poor, even though it was an insolvent, corrupted institution. The third problem was the strangest. In 2011, the public protector, South Africa's ombudsman, decided to investigate a bank bailout in uh, bail out the South African Reserve Bank did in 1985. For the record, I was in my first year of university in 1985. But I had to answer uh, for this bailout. And this bailout was for an institution called Bankop, later taken over by APSA, one of our big four banks. There was talk that the bank had received money improperly, and it was argued that APSA owed the government a refund. When this was investigated in the 1990s, nothing came of it. The allegations were found to be baseless. Nonetheless, the Public Protector's Office decided to reopen the matter, and in June 2017, the Public Protector issued a finding that APSA had to pay back some 1 billion rents, roughly 70 million dollars, uh, 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 change the coupe and also ordered to our surprise that parliament changed the constitution so that the reserve bank mandate stopped being protecting the value of the currency in the interest of balance and sustainable growth and instead it should have a much more opaque duty to look after the socio-economic well-being of South Africans. How much clearer can you be about a mandate of a central bank? You must be wondering how an, an ombuds office goes from investigating 30-year-old bank bailout to changing the constitution. We all wondered. Ultimately, the courts threw out both these findings, yet, Although we were all surprised by the attack coming like that, we had not anticipated such a flagrant disregard of the law. 
This brings me back to the point I started at the, I raised at the start of my talk. When I reflect on what the Reserve Bank was doing during this period, I cannot say it was all about maintaining a credible commitment to sound monetary policy. The problem we were really addressing was the principal agent problem. The people of South Africa were relying on their government to look after their interests, while some people were instead using public power to pilfer. The SAP made that more difficult, which is why the bank was being attacked. The terrifying thing we saw was how easy it is to flip between equilibria. There is one equilibrium where the rule of law is upheld and corruption is not tolerated, and most people then do their jobs honestly. And then there is another equilibrium where people use their power to enrich themselves, where there is impunity and where everyone has the incentive to take what they can before there is nothing left. Over the past 10 years, we moved from the first equilibrium towards the second, slowly at first, much faster towards the end. Many good institutions were weakened. It is not a surprise to me that the institutions which survived best were the ones with independence, particularly the Reserve Bank and the judiciary. Independence is a powerful defense. Many times during my term, we have reflected with gratitude on the foresight of our founding mothers and fathers who saw what could happen in the future and gave us the constitutional tools to defend ourselves. The writers of our constitutions were students of history. They reflected especially closely on the African experience where people had suffered so many disappointments in the decades after independence. Perhaps the greatest being how leaders looted and impoverished their countries instead of governing them in the public interest. When our constitution was adopted, the president was Nelson Mandela. And it would have been easy to take good leadership for granted. But good laws last longer than good leaders. And it was very helpful 20 years down the line to have the constitutional protections, the checks and balances, and the guarantees of independence. This emphasis on how independent institutions can protect democracies from bad leadership implies a close connect connection between how we think about central banks and how we think about judiciaries. I appreciate that central banks have narrower tasks than judiciaries and aren't peer organs of government. They are not the fourth branch, but the comparison has some utility in two ways. First, the example of judiciaries is relevant because they too need to honor democracy while exercising unelected power. They are also confronted with the challenge from elected officials. I am elected and you are not, so shut up and listen to me. In practice, judiciaries do not resolve this tension through a policy of maximum deference. Rather, they typically take direction from the rights and values embodied in their country's foundational laws. And they confront violation of these principles when they see them. They appreciate that there is more to government than 50% plus one vote. The lesson for central banks is we can honor democracy without feeling obliged to define it in strictly majoritarian terms, in which only directly elected leaders have any legitimacy. Democracy ensures that government serves the interests of the people. It does not consist of elections only. One of the greatest threats facing our society is the ruler who is more powerful than anyone else and therefore cannot be stopped by anyone, even when he is acting against the interest of the principles, the people. Not all leaders are bad.
I have met many good leaders and some who have behaved better in easier times. But a small portion of leaders are bad. And if you understand probability, then you know sooner or later, most countries will get a bad leader. There is nothing undemocratic about buying some insurance against this eventuality. And independent central banks like judiciaries are useful parts of those insurance policies. Second, the judiciary, like judiciaries, central banks tend to be relatively high performing institutions. There is a famous book about judiciaries called uh, uh, The Least Dangerous Branch. The idea is that all parts of government can do terrible things, but the judiciary tends to do the least harm. I think central banks have a parallel claim. Uh, for a start, central banks generally maintain high standards of honesty and competence. Every now and then when there is a story about corruption in a central bank, people are shocked. By contrast, when last was anyone surprised by a corruption story in a government procurement agency or a legislative office? Furthermore, central banks tend to be good at what they do, especially when their performances are compared with other parts of government. In emerging markets, inflation is at long-term lows. Many countries have moved beyond the problem of the original sin, the inability of emerging markets to borrow long-term in local currency, in large part because independent central banks mean the local money can now be trusted. Given how many financial crises have been caused by, by original sin and how pervasive it was, this is important progress. In advanced economies, central banks can make an even grander claim to have been the only game in town. In the years after the global financial crisis, this was not a position they desired, and it is not optimal from a policy perspective. But aren't you glad there was a, a game at least? Central bankers did as much as anyone to avert another Great Depression. We are now worried about the rise of populism and reinvigorated nationalisms. But imagine how much worse this would have been with a debt deflation spiral and double-digit unemployment. This record tells us this case for independent central banks is not just theoretical. We have tried these institutions in many countries and the experiments have generally succeeded. If anyone looks at this history and concludes independent central banks should be abolished, well, we might ask, what parts of governments deserve to survive? Of course, it's not enough to say we have got a record of success and now we must be left alone. The principal agent problem applies to central banks too. If there are no accountability mechanisms, what is to stop central bankers privileging their own interests over those of society? Part of the solution to this so far has been cultural, in the sense that there is a community of central bankers with high standards and strong norms. This isn't a hard or legal guarantee, but as with many professions, it is important because it works even when people aren't watching. Even better, however, is having nothing to hide. Modern central banks, unlike their forebears, actively embrace transparency and communication. We try to be clear about what we are doing, why, and what evidence we rely upon for our decisions. This also promotes accountability because it is easier to assess success or failure. These values, transparency, and accountability, have served as well, and I doubt central bank independence will be tenable without them. We will also need ideas of tackling new challenges. To conclude, I'd like to address two broad problems, one to do with financial stability mandates and the one affecting the price stability mandate. Regarding financial stability, 
I opened this, uh, my, this talk with a problem. Financial stability is probably an inescapable responsibility for central banks. But in a it is in a dangerous environment for an independent agency to operate more so than the monetary policy space. How best can we navigate it? I have two suggestions. First, we usually frame the problem in this sphere as one of independent central banks taking decisions away from duly elected authorities. But sometimes, independence helps ensure decisions are made in full view of the public by the appropriate authorities instead of being shirked. Let me give you an example. In South Africa, one of the worst examples of state capture have been state-owned enterprises, which pose a significant fiscal risk. State-owned enterprises are a financial stability issue, and shouldn't the Reserve Bank be bailing them out, was the question. Absolutely not. The challenge of dealing with too big to fail state-owned enterprises of combining cash injections with conditionality measures needs to be dealt with by elected authorities, as it has been in the latest budget from the National Treasury. The sub's power to say no was greatly enhanced by its independence. Second um, suggestion, sometimes central banks face a tough choice between on the one hand, stretching their mandates and raising legitimacy questions, and on the other hand, staying in their safe spaces, but then risking bad economic outcomes. For instance, with Lehman Brothers, I understand there were legal problems, but I wish the Fed had found a way to prevent its bankruptcy. Similarly, I'm glad it was possible to give other investment banks access to Fed funds and to prevent AIG from collapsing. Finding the right balance here is always going to be an art. Fortunately, we have some master class performances to draw on for lessons in how it's done. When the ECB had to manage the euro crisis, it did with just a few ways, doing whatever it takes. But the council followed them with a major effort to convince leaders who ultimately backed the plan in public. They also worked to address, address the concerns of critics by devising conditionality measures for bond purchases. In policy, there is always a trade-off between how decisively you act and how widely you consult. In a crisis, the trade-off becomes very difficult indeed, but it doesn't have to be impossible. I think a useful term here is one we used a lot in South Africa during our transition to democracy. It's called sufficient consensus. It meant given the importance of moving forward, you can't permit filibustering, but you also can't make decisions unilaterally and ride roughshod over opponents. The ECB team did a masterful job of achieving sufficient consensus. And I think that's what central banks should aim for in future financial crises. Finally, on monetary stability, for once, I am concerned with too little inflation. In emerging markets, we still mostly worry about inflation being high, but some advanced economies keep on missing their targets from below. Frankly, it doesn't seem to me so terrible to have price stability. That was the original goal with 2% inflation targets. The idea was to get an inflation rate households and firms wouldn't notice. The problem with winning the war on inflation, however, is that the only price movements left tend to be temporary from supply shocks. This makes it easy to forget the responsibility of monetary policy for inflation. Indeed, the so-called monetary, modern monetary theorists even think you can do away with independent central banks and tackle inflation with other tools. Well, if you build a maximum security jail and there are no escapes, does that prove you didn't need to build a jail? I think it proves you built it right. The same goes for inflation. <laughs> 
Price stability is proof of the success of independent central banks, not an, an argument for their abolition. But I worry there is a new generation coming of age in the advanced economies who have never experienced inflation and won't appreciate that subtlety. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, central banks may be under attack, but they deserve to be defended. They have been principled agents, serving the interests of their citizens, mostly with more effectiveness than people usually get from their governments. There are any number of institutions needing, needing reform in this world. It would be best if the energy of our critics and our defenders could be directed to those, those other causes instead. Meanwhile, for central bankers, we should always bear in mind that independence is not a birthright, but something we need to get up every day and end. Our insulation from day-to-day -day politics create a special responsibility to, our to do our jobs right and to be transparent and accountable so that our principals, the citizens, can see we are living up to this privilege. Thank you. Governor, that was simply terrific. Uh, as someone who started my career writing a dissertation on central bank independence, you're going back and reminding people that it's not just about the uh, price stability and not just about the inflation bias. It's about a broader role in society uh, really rang home, especially coming from the hard-won examples you gave. Uh, we have a very distinguished audience with us tonight, and we also, in a new initiative by the Peterson Institute and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, we've promoted your lecture globally to students of economics and asked them to try to tune in, and if they have questions and comments, to do so as well. So rather than tie things up myself, why don't I get a couple questions from our distinguished audience, and then we can also pull in some of the student questions later. Uh, who would like to go first, or I will call on a not-so-shy member of our board. All right. Um, Jacob Frankel, you're the remaining uh, other ex-governor. Maybe you could start us off with some of your reflections on central bank independence. Thank you. This was terrific indeed. Thank you so much. As you described the textbook case for independence and you spoke about the inflation bias and uh, all the rest of these things, I could not uh, resist thinking about, as I came back from Europe last week, all of them were worried about inflation being too low and how do we raise it. And you come to this country, the same story, inflation is too low, how do you raise it? And you go to some of the emerging countries, and they have the traditional problem, inflation is too high, how do you bring stability? Are we having two different universes in this regard, or is it all part of a continuum that somehow manifests itself differently in two parts of the world? Well, we are talking of two different uh, economies. It's definitely a continuum. The point here is that central banks should worry about inflation rising as much as they would worry about inflation dropping below zero because it has got its own consequences. So the framework is uh, roughly the same. So you would say that it's a, con it's a continuum. But the point here is that I don't want to know to say emerging markets are fortunate that they still have inflation, which means that monetary policy becomes uh, effective. But the general disinflation that you have seen globally is feeding itself into the emerging market uh, economies. And they say 
as an emerging market central bank, one of the things that we had been clear uh, 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 about was to distinguish the shock, positive shock that had come through, that had enabled uh, inflation in our case to decline. And one of the key issues in South Africa is that we had had a positive supply side shock with food prices. It brought down, it brought down uh, inflation. And of course, the challenge is always to then say, how do you look through the shock so that you respond to the second round effects? And it became a very good problem to have because most of the time we had found ourselves explaining that inflation has run away from target because of negative supply side shock that uh, uh, led to a rise in prices. And now we are having to do the explanation on the other side. Fortunately, we have not broken the lower uh, part of our lower bound of our inflation target range, but having to do the same in explanation to say, in the same manner that when you had a negative supply shock, policy didn't respond. There is no reason for policy to respond when you are having a positive supply shock uh, on the uh, on the downside. Thank you. Uh, another question, if I can call upon someone, please. There, Dick, could you go to the microphone? You uh, promote price stability, a major objective. Uh, I wrote a book along with Susan Collins and several other people on South Korea during the 70s and the 80s. And the average inflation, that, that was the period of South Korea's greatest growth. Uh, the average inflation rate in South Korea was 14% per year. It went up and down, but the average was 14%. It was always, in my judgment, under control. So it's not a runaway inflation like we've seen in several countries, Zimbabwe, for example. Um, but um, uh, I would be hard pressed to argue that South Korea would have done even better than it did if it had a single digit inflation, say 4%. And so, again, thinking of emerging markets, there are several reasons uh, why a double dig low double-digit inflation actually may be advantageous. And do central bankers ever talk about that possibility among themselves? An interesting uh, uh, comment. Uh, I would like to use uh, three South African episodes to make, my, to make my point. The first South African episode was the period uh, mid-80s until early 90s. We had inflation at around 20%, and growth was barely 2%. It actually, in some of the years, was negative. And in the period um, uh, after uh, the transition to democracy, we still had double-digit inflation and growth was bubbling around 3%. The fastest growth episode that we had was in the period from 2002 until 2008 growth averaged 4.5% and inflation was low. So I would struggle if anybody would convince South Africans that the period of high inflation would have been good for growth because South Africa has not experienced an episode where we had high growth in an environment where we had high inflation. And the way in which I uh, tend to explain it to the South African public had been that those of you, because South Africans, uh, they don't talk inflation, we don't talk inflation, we talk interest rates. So I'd say um, those of you who would like to have interest rates at 26%, which is what we had in 1998, just invite inflation of 18%, then you will have interest rates of 26%. 
And so, when we looked at South Africa's historical evolution, and I, we have also tried to look at it across countries, we're not finding a statistically significant relationship of high inflation and high growth. On the contrary, we actually had found that an environment of low inflation had actually been associated with uh, high growth. Now, we can go and argue about uh, these things and we can pick up when this country, this country experienced it, it was different. But the bottom line here is that in this current environment, it would be very difficult to argue that you can create growth by generating high uh, 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 double-digit uh, uh, inflation. Be that as it may, something else had changed amongst emerging markets. And actually, even in the advanced economies in South Africa, it had changed too. South Africa has got about 20% of its uh, debt indexed to inflation. About 20%. And um, South Africa, uh, given its, the structure of its labor markets, has got public sector wage agreements that are indexed to inflation. A sure way to break the South African fiscals is to allow inflation uh, to rise because debt service costs and wage costs will become astronomical. Thank you. Fred, could you go, Fred and Anna, if you could go to the back mic and we'll collect the two questions for the governor. Uh, Fred Bergson here from the Peterson Institute. Thank you, Mr. Governor. I'd like to take advantage of your chairmanship of the IMFC and ask you a question about that. How do you think the IMF is doing? How do you think the international monetary system is doing in forging cooperation to deal with all the problems we face today? How do you see it from the perspective of South Africa, a developing country that's a member of the BRICS group as well as other broader organizations. Tell us a little bit about how you perceive of the effectiveness of the international monetary regime we have now and how could it do better? Before you respond, uh, so you have a choice of what to answer. Um, uh, <laughs> Anna Gelpern here at the Peterson and Georgetown uh, Law School. Um, Governor, this was a fascinating uh, talk, and it made me wonder what you think the value is of an explicit financial stability mandate. So you talked a bit about the expanding the expansion of central bank mandates and the political risks of that. But in particular, so much of what you said went to financial stability and the uh, time inconsistency questions there, um, and I wonder what you think about that. But since that was a very broad question, you should totally feel free to take all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's start with yours, and then we will end with the international monetary system, whilst David Lipton is, uh, uh, is uh, preparing an answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, financial stability mandates, whether it is explicit or not, central banks will find it difficult to ignore it. In South Africa, we had had uh, a focus on financial stability from 2002, and we didn't have any power in law uh, to do financial uh, stability. What the explicit financial stability mandate did was to enable us to have the tools that can be utilized for uh, financial stability. And these tools are varied, and I must say, the financial stability mandate is a difficult one because central bankers, we like quantifying things. So we can quantify the inflation, uh, the price stability mandate, and says this is price stability, we have defined it, here is the target. Can't do that with financial stability. Uh, uh, stability, and um, uh, there was a survey done by the uh, BIS, I think, which uh, reviewed the financial stability mandates of, of central banks, and it all goes something like uh, financial stability is the absence of financial instability, something along <laughs> those lines. And so how do you um, 
do you uh, do you target this thing? So you end up with lots of tools in your toolbox which you could use in different uh, areas. Most of the tools uh, we believe are um, battle ready, but most of the tools have not been battle tested. And in many respects, when we deal with the issue of financial stability, we think that we could impose these things and um, slow down credit, for example, and so forth. It doesn't follow that when you utilize the tool in the other direction that it will necessarily work. And as we have also found is that these things are not symmetric. That is, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is the thing about the financial stability money. But it also means that central banks have to navigate very carefully around the financial stability mandates because sometimes it could easily suck the central banks into the, uh, into the politics of the country. And many of the instances where I was talking uh, about it, um, every time there is a uh, bank failure somewhere, somebody looks at the central bank, even when the central bank didn't have the responsibility, where were you? So uh, it sucks the central banks into these things, but it is an area that central banks can't say, we do not want to do because we just want to be narrow. Of course, it would have been nice to be narrow, as Mevin King would say, bring back boring. Uh, unfortunately, the situation is anything but boring at the, uh, at the moment. Um, Fred, you know, one of the things, the pieces I read as a student of the international monetary system, if I remember well, was authored by you. <laughs> and, and so... That's an answer he'll like. <laughs> <laughs> now, it sounds like you are putting me in an exam. Did you read my paper? Um, um, I actually think that the IMF is doing a terrific job. I have concerns and, I, and, and fears. And my concerns and fears is that as we tried to get out of the 2008 financial crisis, no, actually, let me take a step back. Before the 2008 global financial crisis, there was an engagement in uh, the fund uh, about uh, whether we need all of these people that are in the fund. And so the fund was mis being made to cut down on uh, uh, numbers. And the crisis set in, and then uh, the fund would do something. And so the fund had to go back and get all of those people that had been uh, retrenched to come and uh, uh, assist. And then as it turned out, the fund didn't have enough firepower. And the G20 met, and we decided to commit a lot of resources to the fund, both quota and borrowed, uh, and borrowed resources, so that we could instill some confidence in the international uh, monetary system. Fast forward, uh, we're coming to the point and we say that the fund needs resources. And uh, at the very least, we must protect the resources that the fund has now so that it has got the firepower to respond to some crisis that uh, comes. What have we done? We've spent a lot of time debating on whether we think that the fund should be having these resources in the first place. And... Um, uh, and we couldn't quite uh, uh, finalize the decision. But, you know, there are good men and women in the fund. There are good men and women in the IMFC. And they have been tasked with finding the solution so that by the time we come to the uh, uh, annual uh, uh, meetings, there is some form, some form of a solution. And lastly is that I worry that... Uh, in the same manner that I talked about central banks and the independence and how they should end their legitimacy, it's important that we protect the legitimacy of the fund. And protecting the legitimacy of the fund would mean making the fund to, be, to reflect uh, the changes in the global economy. And that fact that the fund is a quota-based institution, and because it is a quota-based institution, quotas should form a significant part of the resources that the fund, uh, the, fund, uh, uh, the fund has. Absent the resources of the fund and absent the legitimacy of the fund, what you are going to have is a proliferation of regional arrangements, bilateral arrangements, and I think we are going to have a fragmented uh, international monetary system that might not serve us uh, 
Uh, but I think for me, uh, we actually need to be ensuring that we have got an effective global financial safety net and at the center of that global financial safety net, you have got to have the fund. You get an A plus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with Fred. I think, I think Governor Lasecha Kaganyago gets an A plus for the 19th annual Stavros Niarchos Foundation Lecture on Principled Agents, Reflections on Central Bank Independence. We're very grateful to have principled public servants like you in your countries, in the international sphere, and sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.